what does the panel think about uh, the idea that uh, uh, I am God and I am also not God simultaneously? That uh, qualitatively I'm the same as God, but quantitatively I'm very different from Him. It's like uh, a, a green bird going into a green tree. It maintains its identity when it merges in with the tree, or, or another example, or a fish in the river merges in with the ocean. It maintains its identity whilst it's in the ocean as well. So uh, this idea that I'm God is this is addressed to every, everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Well? Yes? Well, I mean, I'll be carrying that. I'm asking from my own understanding. But not the one what I don't know, I think professors are, two professors use this term. You see, in, uh, in, uh, in the materialist skeptics of the, of the followed Rig Veda, they, uh, there, there was one quote, sir. He has been recorded, attested in, uh, in Yaskar's uh, Yasks in Nerukta, 9th century BC. And Koch points out 11 logical errors in the Vedic statements. And one of them is contradiction. You see? So there is, there is one Rudra and there are a thousand Rudras. There is a God, there is no God. So, so these contradictions. Now they are apparent the contradictions, but if you relate it to our daily life, popular life, popular life, in fact this is a mode of statement which is fairly common. Somebody asked me, are you happy? Well, I am happy, I am not happy. <laughs> you see, because these words, these words, these words have uh, limited boundaries and they, they tie down the mind, they try to tie down the mind. But the mind doesn't uh, uh, limit itself. Just as they say the eight, the six cases, karakas, you see the entire mind, the structure of sentences is only around six cases. It's not, it, it, then the human mind will be terribly constrained. The poets attempt by making metaphors, by introducing, you know, devices, figurative devices, like, and contradiction would be one such. A hyperbole would be another. Tautology would be still another mythology and so on. Therefore, not to take contradiction literally, but to interpret it. Uh, uh, one beautiful example given, if I allow me, unless Madam Vibhaji can. <laughs> <laughs> she will come up and tell me please stop. Then, there is a beautiful example given by us. Says that, uh, uh, Kautsa says, Rig Veda makes statements which are illogical. For example, it proscribes the impossible. What cannot be done, it is proscribed. Don't pile fire in the sky. But you can't pile fire in the sky. And yet Veda says, don't pile fire in the sky. And you know the answer, beautiful answer. He says, every young mother, every young mother, at least once in her life, there is a small baby, four months old baby, who can't even tell. When she puts that baby down on the bed, says, Don't run away, I am coming. <laughs> <laughs> now why? Why? Because it expresses not the fact that he will run away, but her love and she is in fact looking into the future when this baby will be running. Mm. And that led later Shavar Swami to assert that no linguistic statement is meaningless. Thank you very much. All right, wonderful. So I have a question for uh, Dr. Herati and Dr. Thompson. Uh, would, would you agree that uh, part of the job of the Orientalists was to be a backup for the British Empire? Because the Orientalists would quite often, as you mentioned, call the colonized people heathens. And in the case of India, when they came along, they saw very advanced civilization. And for a colonizer to have a conscience-free sleep, they had to run down the local people. So uh, the terms like mythologists came in. 
So even Indians and non-Indians keep on talking about the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana as mythologies, as somebody's made up stories. So would you agree that uh, the Orientalists uh, were actually doing uh, a job for the empire so that people could have a, a conscious free sleep? No. Uh, Max Wheeler was one of them who did. I, I wouldn't agree with that as a characterization. Uh, not, not to say that there weren't uh, uh, scholars complicit with empire and connected with empire in, in a vast variety of very complicated ways. I'm not quite sure what in fact being complicit with empire means. Because I think of myself, am, am I complicit with the corrupt late capitalist system of global inequality? Uh, I think we're all embroiled in our age. Uh, in, in various ways, some people more directly than others, and I think we have to judge on a case-by-case -case basis. I also am as yet unaware of a group of people that don't spend a large amount of their time describing other people as qualitatively and practically inferior to them in quite <laughs> wide varieties of ways. There are always in crowds and out crowds. I'm not explaining away or making light of uh, exploitative or problematic typologies or, or any of these things, but I'm saying that the matter is complicated and worthy of case-by-case -case analysis and not blanket statements in word, either direction. Yeah. The word mythology, what do you think? Well, again, I mean, I think mythology, as with any English word or any word in any language, can be applied well or poorly. So again, case-by-case. Case. <laughs> you see, uh, I say that um, as an example Please. of, uh, if you like, a counter-example, um, Sir William Jones, uh, as you probably know about Sir William Jones, he, he was the um, High Court judge in Calcutta yes. in 1798, I think it was. He'd learned 28 languages. 1784 to 1790. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, he then came across Sanskrit. And he said about it that it was far finer uh, than Greek, more uh, developed than Latin, that it could be the original language. That gave rise to the very study of the science of linguistics. Now, he was very interested <coughs> in the Gita, in the laws of Manu, and addressing this, the needs of the people at the time to try to be a good judge. Now, uh, we are still benefiting from his insights. Um, and uh, I think one has to be a bit careful of making, as you said, making blanket judgments and look for what is positive in everything. And there's a great deal of positive work that has been done and is being done both in England and in India and all across the world, particularly when attention is being given to the Sanskrit language which is certainly the most perfected language that I've come across. And for that one gives him one great thanks. And it is a great inspiration that there is a possibility of a renaissance coming as a result of that attention. But the attention needs to be very fine and concentrated on the beauty and the work of that language. It will transform us if we attend to it. Don't worry about myths or otherwise. Just concentrate on the beauty of the Sanskrit language. It will transform us. And I would like to ask a question. Uh, it's a very fascinating uh, session uh, all the day. Uh, I have, uh, uh, Gita has been a part of my life from the very beginning. I understand it. But for a lay person, uh, if you see the, the whole uh, Karma Yoga and Detachment, these are the two great underlying themes of Bhagavad Gita. For a layman, often people have asked me that Karma Yoga, how can you achieve Karma Yoga with complete detachment? Because detachment, it, 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 to do Karma Yoga, to attain something in life, you have to be motivated. And unless and until you are attached to that mood, you are motivated, you cannot achieve it. So this contradiction, uh, how would the panel uh, respond to it? I'll be very interested. Thank you. May I ask you one thing? Yes. When a surgeon, when a surgeon amputates a gangrenous limb, isn't he doing something with the detachment? Yes, it is. But 
for personal ambition. No, no. I mean a surgeon amputating a gangrenous limb for what personal glory, personal. Innumerable anonymous cases are handled like this by surgeons. In, uh, again, uh, in uh, that Nirukta, uh, he says, there is a prayer, the prayer to the axe. A phrase, cut the branch kindly. Mm. Kindly. So when a woodcutter cuts a dead wood, a dead wood, he is doing karma without attachment. Without attachment. Involvement. What about the ambition to become Prime Minister of India? No, Prime don't. Prime I don't know. You did ask about him. No, no. You ask about him separately, <laughs> I will give a separate answer. Sir, that is not the only example. I, I just want you to... Uh, no, no, no. We need not... Can you say, look, no, we are not talking about politicians and all. No, no. Yeah. Can I uh, approach it a slight different way? Yes. Um, the, we quoted Karmani Eva Adhikaraste Mafaleshu Kadatana. This is the fundamental fact that one has only the right to work but none to the fruits thereof. But to maintain the life with that, it, in my experience, it may not be true for others, the key thing that has made the difference in my life is half an hour's meditation, morning and evening. The meditation is the, the key to the practice of Karma Yoga. Just in response, so very simply, uh, responding to you, not actually, I have any doubt. Uh, see, if Bhagavad Gita also doesn't deny your right of doing something with ambition, motivation, and all that. Krishna never said that. Only the thing is, as long as you do any karma with attachment or ambition or with an eye on its fruit and with a motivation and all that, you are prone to enjoy the shoka and the moha arising out of it. You be ready. If you don't want to be get affected by your karmas, shoka, moha and that's why Arjuna fell down in the beginning. So then if you do not want to be affected by them, Absolutely. now start doing this practice of detached karma. <laughs> it is up to you. It is up to you. Business MBA people cannot say, Gita says that you have detachment motivation. Without motivation, MBA teaches from class one to class last, only motivation. That is their job. Let them do it. And they rise, they fall, they rise, they fall. But if you want to Firmly establish yourself in a particular state of consciousness where nothing will disturb you whatsoever, then the path of Krishna is to you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much. Ji, sir. Sir, there is, there is still time. You can take one or two more questions. The, my simple question is can a deaf and dumb person who cannot speak, who cannot listen, can he be enlightened or can he call that I am Brahmasmi or I am God? Because, because it is experiential. You see, even those who speak and who hear, they are very often deaf and dumb. All of us have eyes open, but we don't all see. Sir, again, again we have an example in Upanishad itself. Vamadeva being in the womb of his mother himself where God will liberate. He, with, even before birth, there is a Vamadeva has got liberated, attained the moksha when he was yet to be born. So defendum, nothing will come in the real Ashtavakra and there are several peoples with the, so many of challenges of physical challenges have attained the liberation greatly even with the, uh, much enrolled along with enrolled persons. When God stops two senses, it heightens some other two, three. I certainly see known some blind students. Extra. Yeah. See, yes, sir. You know, I think, put an end to this. <laughs> yes, madam. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. We are told two questions possible. 
one done, one more. <laughs> and that's all. Yes, ma'am. Mine is a very generic question. Um, I, have been, I have been very impressed today that uh, the Indian origin has come into West and we are having this conference and I'm grateful to Nerve Center for organizing such an event. Um, working in the health and social care, my question is to James. Um, as to how do you integrate um, this concept into lives of people who are suffering from the mental health and social care system because we're not allowed to bring religion into it so we can never introduce something as religion into it. Could you guide me to a theory which would allow me to integrate this inspirational learning today that I've had without colluding it as a religion which is from Bhagavad Gita because we work in a diverse community. It will be very difficult to relate it to Bhagavad Gita. But I know one thing that the social care and the mental health has started taking up the concept of yoga, yoga and meditation. And a lot of people go to Brahma Kumaris for me to attain that because they give that free service to the community. I want to personally integrate this theme of karma and moksha into my work. How could I do that without offending the hierarchy or offending anybody religiously? There's no need to identify the sources because, and also the word religion may not apply to all the texts because Indian texts are not uh, sacred. They are not scriptures, and uh, it's wrong to call them divine also. Although divine divinity were translated by Cambridge professors, those words were used. But in our tradition, you see, Vedas are not sacred. No. So that's why you have people tearing Vedas from day one. <laughs> from day one. I mean, from the moment they were composed and there was Mahabharat war, after that, you see, there were skeptics, you know, who questioned everything in the Vedas. So, today also, you have half the people abusing Vedas and are defending them. It's good to abuse a text because then the defenders arise. And they are defended and they remain alive. You see? So, it's not necessary to say this is Bhagavad Gita. You see, if you say this is universal, these are universal ideas, you just talk about the ideas. That's all. That you must do your duty, you must do your duty without expecting anything. Not that you will not be given something, but then. <laughs> don't, expect, don't expect too much. They say you are karma yoga. And then, but of course, if you say that whatever you do, you will have to pay a price for it. That will be then drawing really into depths of, you know, system, ideas, against which in the Indian mind also reacted at one time or the other. So like right. that. If you might wait to the next session which speaks about values which don't carry this connotation of religion. So if we get a chance to do the next session, we will... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank everybody for the wonderful ideas generated and the audience, or most of the audience, for being so receptive to the Thanks and the discussion also. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sir, we'll take a tea break here and we'll come back at 3.45 again for the third session.